it's like Hollywood. You live in Oakland now, right? No? Oh, and you're teaching there, right? Uh, no. Okay. So my name is Waylon Lewis and uh, with ElephantJournal.com and I'm honored today to be at the Zen Run Victorian Organic Serving Boulder, Colorado B&B uh, Briar Rose, which is directly across the street from Naropa University. And I'm particularly honored, of course, to be here with Maladoma Somme. Mm -hmm. um, where, where are you from? Well, I'm, I'm from the uh, little country uh, situated in the middle of West Africa uh -huh. that they call Burkina Faso. A uh -huh. uh, long time ago, it used to be called Upper Volta. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. By uh, the British. Yeah, by the British. And uh, when, they, when they gave that up to the French, the French still kept, uh, they still kept the name. And uh, it was back in 1983 that they changed the name, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. into Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. which means the land of the proud ancestors. Oh, so that's you know. more of a traditional name? Yeah, it's more of a traditional name, a combination of the two major languages in the area. But the official language in Burkina Faso is French. Huh. And so you go to school, learn French. C'est vrai? <laughs> très, très vrai. Right. <laughs> um, so speaking mm -hmm. of traditional ancestors, you mm -hmm. work um, with sort of your uh, traditional uh, indigenous tradition, what, it, what is that spiritual tradition? Well, that's my area of interest, partly because uh, it has a heavy cultural uh, component to it, given the fact that uh, uh, my work has essentially been to bring the culture and the spirituality of my people in this part of the world. That's right. what I've been doing for nearly 20 years now. Right. And so uh, uh, the, uh, the idea of ancestors really uh, occupied a huge amount of space mm -hmm. in uh, this kind of work. And that is why um, it cannot be avoided, really, mm -hmm. because it's at the core of everything African and of African spirituality. Mm -hmm. There's a perception of a, on a continuity from the dead to the living and beyond. And their notion of community uh, include both those who are in this plane and, and those who are on the other plane mm -hmm. and anybody in the middle, uh, namely all kind of life forms, life you know, the plants, the animals, and so forth. They're all part of the same web of life. And you uh, refer to that a lot as spirit, right? Yeah, I would call that spirit. Right. But, you know, just understand the 100% uh, of what I'm doing is translating mm. from a language that was craft, crafted to encapsulate certain kind of reality. And most of them don't have a ready-made equivalent in English. Mm -hmm. And so, what's the extent to which I'm damaging what I'm, <laughs> what sure. I'm translating? I don't know, because uh, I'm not really a professional translator. I'm just trying to go from one concept, indigenous to Dagora, to uh, something that is relevant to this culture. In other words, something that people here can understand. Otherwise, sure. I'll be talking over their head. Sure. So, in the... In the um in the West, here in America, we often, mm -hmm. any sort of indigenous traditions or Buddhist traditions or yoga, mm -hmm. whatever it is, we often lump it into this thing we call new agey mm -hmm. you know, kind of spirituality, and it's often somewhat pejorative. We look down on it. Yeah, right. Um, but at the same time, there's a real longing to reconnect with um, kind of tradition and uh, culture in a, in a genuine way. That's right. So would you... Do you often find that people in the West consider what you're doing to be new agey? Well, if they do, uh, I don't mind right. as long as it helps them. Uh -huh. uh, like I said earlier, uh, terminology is only terminology. We need words in order to encapsulate something that is oftentimes bigger than the word can encompass them. Yeah. So uh, I have indeed uh, uh, heard uh, new age associated with uh, was what I'm bringing, and I was willing to understand and to uh, to align myself with that, because what is what is wrong about New Age 
uh, beside etymologically, it's a new age, right. which means uh, it might be contrasted with something old or something that has grown old. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means not as interesting. Mm -hmm. But typically speaking, you know, I wouldn't call uh, the, the spirituality of my people a new age thing. I would just call it an old age thing. Right. That's right. something that... It's actually they, quite traditional. That's right, it's quite traditional, and that's what they've been doing, at least uh, up until now, uh, with the changes that are going on. You know, Western influence is creeping everywhere, and indigenous culture have been affected right. the world over, one way or another. Right. And so there is a bargaining that... Uh, will kind of broker how much of the new is kept and how much of the old is maintained and so on and so forth. So this is still a, uh, a refurbishing or kind of mutational stage. Right, the whole updating. Thing is, uh, yeah, updating. Translating. Thing. Yeah, because of history. A sort of master yeah. translator, we were mentioning him before, Chigim Trungpa, the mm -hmm. founder of Naropa, was very specific in what words were used to. Oh. Um, communicate Buddhist principles and he often mm -hmm. would change them every five years or so to try and refine it. He yes. also talked a lot about New Age and spiritual materialism. Um, mm -hmm. And I read something, an interview you did with Mother Jones that oh. struck me as very interesting. You said um, for people to really connect and uh, get through, you were talking about racial and cultural differences. Mm -hmm. In particular, you were saying it's powerful for people to be in a multicultural conference together mm -hmm. and in, when they in, encounter that sort of tension, mm -hmm. um, instead of getting in a fight to stay with that tension, right. and then at that point they could become connected. But yeah. until then, anyone, you said, anyone who says we're all one mm -hmm. is probably lying. And I thought that was an interesting <laughs> statement. Uh, sorry for being that blunt. It's yeah. just uh, out of experience. You know, I've noticed that, uh, you know, what is the chemistry of being real? It really has to do with uh, uh, being able to face up to differences and still survive. Mm -hmm. Realizing that, in fact, uh, even where we think there's only uh, differences, there might be similarity there. And the most uh, vehement uh, proponent of you know, differences is oftentimes looking for similarity. Uh, and that's the irony of the uh, of the whole thing. So, when I when I got the experience that really brought this to uh, to focus, I realized this is a really powerful place for enriching the soul and the spirit of a person who is seeking uh, world spirituality or, or human spirituality, not localized uh, doctrine and dogma to hang on to as a self-defining principle, mm. you know. So for, for me, um, I know that um, when many cultural, many people from various cultural background come together, there is a really challenging opportunity there. It is more than the sum of the people who are meeting. It is an, it's an entire history, uh, both uh, spiritual m and material, but at the same time, an, uh, a, a kind of echo of the very environment that has therefore cradled all these people into maturity and then bringing them together in that fashion. Mm. So the, the, the whole environment, the trees, the plant, the landscape are all there. And so, do I therefore focus on an individual opinion about something that might in the end appear rather petty in the grand scale of thing, mm -hmm. or I try to read beyond um, a person's tempestuous language as a, a struggle to translate a message that he or she is carrying from far beyond, that is articulated from a source that is not this worldly. So uh, eventually, the look to see the spirit behind any kind of gesture or attitude is a lot more enriching mm -hmm. than to take things as face value and place value judgment based on what 
you can touch, smell, you know, sense, you know, using the five senses. You know. I was saying to Heather, we were um, before this interview that mm -hmm. the way you talk about spirit versus uh, sort of what we can see and touch mm -hmm. um, is similar in the in the Buddhist tradition. There's there's an idea that none of this is particularly real, that it's all uh. interdependent, kind of cause and effect, and it's here now, but it's not solid and there's nothing to get attached to. That's right. I, I wonder how that, in America, particularly with Barack Obama running mm -hmm. for president right now, um, and he just gave a, a speech on race. I don't know mm -hmm. if you yes. heard about that or Absolutely. read it. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. how, how does that sort of attitude with the spirit or seeing through getting stuck on differences um, how does that help us kind of get beyond racial misunderstandings? Well, it does challenge us to look at simple thing uh, that when all is said and done, we are like children in the same compound uh, trying to figure out how to be with one another mm -hmm. and having the desperate feeling that there's no daddy or mommy there to tell us this is how you do, you're supposed to behave mm -hmm. because everybody's is a kid uh, in the in the schoolyard or in the you know in the village uh, circle mm -hmm. uh, trying to be seen and to see and so my sense is that uh, uh, you know what uh, Barack Obama was uh, putting forth has deep ramification into the spirit realm. Because what it says is that down at that level, there isn't differences. And actually- There are differences. Uh, no. There when, aren't. The, 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 there's no differences. Uh -huh. and, but the point, the point that uh, we need to be attentive to is the fact that when we get stuck on the surface, on appearances, what happens is that we make ourselves more and more vulnerable to um, a kind of, uh, uh, the kind of mirror that uh, human superficiality uh, uh, does present us with. And so far from wanting to, uh, to settle with what uh, I can see, touch, and smell. If I want to go beyond that, maybe because I'm more motivated by uh, a curiosity that wants to be satisfied only if there is an alternative to the rather stark distinction that appears between you and me. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I will realize that you don't have to look a certain way in order to share the same basic belief principles. Mm -hmm. For instance, spirit uh, does not require that you be white, black, yellow in order for spirit to give a stamp of approval to you. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain sense in which if all of us are looking for a place where there's more unanimity. Uh, spirits seem to be inviting us to come home. Uh, because, uh, and it's my own experience working over the years with various people, the, at the core of every psyche is the need to be seen, to be heard. Um, to be acknowledged. To be acknowledged to be made to feel like they matter, mm -hmm. you know. And what exacerbates this whole thing is the, the increasing ostracism that is manufactured one way or another and placed on an increasing number of people. And so uh, this is the one thing that triggers uh, whatever reaction gets translated into these uh, insolvable differences called race. Uh, uh, when in fact, you know, I would, I would not mind using, uh, using that term in association with real alien, you know, coming from, I don't know what corner of the Delta Quadrant uh -huh. it is, you know, I don't know. That uh -huh. will be really racially right. different. Right but we're still in the same earth. Right. And I'm saying that uh, also because I, I, 
my life experience has brought me face to face to phenomena that uh, I don't have English equivalent to translate, mm -hmm. you know. I've come face to face with living intelligent entities that don't belong here. Right. They are not registered. Right. And so do I, after a repeated moment of interaction with them, continue to act like that didn't happen? simply because it's not in the popular literature, although it is, although well, fictionalized. we talk about ghosts or we talk about not spirits. talking about, you know, in the West, talk about leprechaun. In my culture, we talk about contumbly uh, mm -hmm. uh, and other names. Mm -hmm. Why is it that in a more indigenous culture, these folks are seen as belonging to a planet, a realm that is other than the earth, mm. and they have the technology to come to us. Is it that because we can't go to them that we prefer to dismiss them uh, in order to maintain some kind of supremacy in our own neighborhood? I don't know, but the point is that once you have had this kind of experience, it's really hard to uh, to pretend to that, go back. To, that to go back because there's certain things that just affect you for the rest of your life. What happens yeah. in the spirit world stays in the spirit world, you can say. Well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so for years I've mm -hmm. kind of um, half-jokingly, uh, Reggie Ray is a great Buddhist teacher oh, um, yeah. and teacher at Naropa, and mm -hmm. we've interviewed him, and he was uh, kind of a normal Buddhist teacher mm -hmm. for many years, and then he met you, that's right. and you buried him in the earth for 12 hours or something. Oh God, you haven't forgotten that. Yeah, and after that he started talking about the spirit world and the kind of ghosts or unseen mm -hmm. spirits, I think is how he put it, That's something right. like that. And he kind of got a little, uh, a little different. Mm -hmm. he, didn't go, he couldn't go back. So what are these rites, what are these um, traditions that you're introducing to Westerners? And is that's a good yeah. question. Uh, basically, you know, to simplify, I like to call them, uh, you know, uh, elemental ritual, earth-based ritual, mm -hmm. the kind that uh, takes into account uh, the, the magic and spirituality associated with various components that we live with, various components of the reality that surrounds us. Uh, in, um, in my culture, we refer to them as, for instance, fire. Uh, what is the components in there beside the fact that it warms us up? It uh, it does all kind of thing, good or bad. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. You know, water. It's opposite, or so it seems. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the piece uh, that addresses itself to Earth. You know, why bury yourself to uh, uh, to the ground? Uh, and knowing that from an indigenous uh, African perspective, the earth is just the uh, microcosm, that is the bigger representation of a house, you know, home. Hmm. Earth and home hmm. are, are, they, are, are the one and same thing. You know, we haven't figured out a way to get away from here and go live somewhere else. You know, we just move from one part of the body of the earth to another mm -hmm. and settle there, calling it home. So. All of that uh, raised the issue of the, uh, the potential archetypal meaning uh, associated with such an element. There are two others, such as the mineral that are associated with memory and the storage and circulation of information, and finally nature, which apparently is uh, the realm of change and transformation, magic. Uh, which I noticed uh, is of great interest in the West. You know, anything in media that appears otherworldly, of the Harry Potter uh, quality, right. seem to attract a lot of interest. You know, and what is going on parallel to that is more like the uh, uh, the assumption that this is fictional. Why is that the psyche? feels so drawn towards something that the mind consider non-existent. Right. Is 
that because the mind and the psyche are engaged in an ideological battle so that they are from different countries, you know, the mind is from wherever and the heart, the, the heart or the spirit is from wherever else. I don't know, but in bringing this ritual to this part of the world, and, uh, including burying people, I was just um, uh, experimenting with the effect that ritual done in a particular corner of the world just because the people there only grew up with it. I was interested in finding out what, what, what would they do here. Mm. And I found out that uh, they have the power to suck somebody in in such a way that the person is never the same again. Uh -huh. uh, you see, in this day and age, uh, in this culture, we are really hung up to a, to a word, uh, especially lately, change. Uh -huh. you know, and uh, any person who comes into the spotlight is mostly seen as a person who can wield change. There is an underlying implication associated with that, that somehow uh, we are allergic to stagnation. Uh -huh. Same old, same old can turn into some kind of boring thing. And that's what I've, I've ended up liking in, in Reggie, for instance. Mm -hmm. Who has the boldness <laughs> to go from, you know, what I may call traditional Buddhism mm -hmm. uh, and dive into the African unknown uh -huh. and not show sign of finding that all that contradictory to the kind of thing that uh, he is most familiar with. So people with the capacity to uh, deploy this level of flexibility and uh, we call that wateriness, you know, the flow like water, they, they by facing obstacle with a kind of gentle approach and so forth. So people like that are really offering, offering the change, the, the chance of uh, the kind of change that might be permanent. Right. I would say. And uh, again, that states something favorable to spirituality in, in general, and particularly the kind of spirituality that comes with a tradition, that in fact they have come to these type of practices out of experience, and their, their, their certitude that indeed an ongoing flow is what deserves our focus, knowing that the chair you're sitting on is actually immaterial. It's a bunch of, uh, you know, molecules stacked up together, sure you anyway, um, and uh, because of a specific uh, sort of contract or agreement they have, they stay bonded together. Mm -hmm. Well, if one of them start acting out, well, we translate that into a decay of the, of the article of uh, comfort that you're sitting on. So in the same way, what about us? The chain that we're talking about is the one that uh, might perhaps uh, help us bond with one another, regardless of the geography of our, of our growth. Just the same way bonding us together will, will affect this type of community that blends itself with an environment that uh, we're, we're in. You know, I don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, uh, me neither. Sounded good at the time. Yeah, no, it was brilliant. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to keep up. So, um, a lot of these rituals, which you experienced rather mm -hmm. belatedly, like around the age of 20 or something, when you went back yeah, to yeah, the village, yeah, at a younger age, how yeah. to become a proper man in mm -hmm. your case. What you you do work, I understand, like with Robert Bly and various um, people are big fans of yours in terms of yeah. men's issues. How do we in this day and age, 21st century, how do we be a uh, gentleman? Well, that's, uh, you know, that's a question of uh, what style, uh, what style of uh, change you want. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the work I've done with uh, those super folks, uh, mostly uh, 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 in the area of ritual, where I was contributing the experience that I had, because that's the only way, that's the only way, I, or the only thing I knew. Uh, but what I've gained from that 
was the insight into a potential uh, uh, anatomy of the structure of ritual and the aim, the purpose of it. Uh, and like in the village where you do that because uh, that's what everybody had been doing uh, for as long as anybody remembers. So when the season come and you are ushered onto those things, you do it because you want to uh, deepen your sense of belonging to the community. But here, the one thing I've noticed is that indeed uh, there is a, a psychic craving for an interface with the sacred. Uh, one that uh, seemed to uh, desire deeply uh, to construct that interface in such a way that the, the other parties is as close to nature and as respectful of nature as possible, which is something that I, uh, I respect a lot. Um, it appears to me that this is a, uh, a departure from a more dogmatic uh, secular religions, uh, uh, such as Christianity, for instance. Um, but the bottom line for me was uh, the discovery that indeed no matter how westernized or modernized anybody is, there is a core indigenous person in that, in that uh, sophistication hidden somewhere right. that would burst out in the face of a proper introduction into uh, a sacred space in which interaction with the natural environment is authorized. Right. In the West, yeah. we often, uh, you know, the rational or scientific point of view is often associated with sort of the male point of view, not believing in magic. That's right. And Harry Potter and the ritual. That's right. So, so again, how do we, um, you know, kind of be proper men? Do we explore more of that ritual? Well, I think that uh, uh, proper masculinity has to undergo the, uh, the, f the fire of transformation into that uh, emotional space mm -hmm. in which um, somehow the heart is let open. Uh -huh. uh, how do we do that? To that, be more, yeah. first, no, I, I, I was making a certain kind of assumption, the way to getting there is mm -hmm. not an intellectual process. Uh -huh. It is an experiential encounter with the sacred, uh -huh. which means, you know, burying you on the ground, something so unscientific and so, uh, right. uh, uh, you name it, it is there. Like a sweat lodge uh, or a uh, A sweat a lodge, a, a vision quest where you can stand on the mountain in the cold and uh, find some ways to turn your whole body into a hearth, generating heat uh -huh. to keep you warm enough so that you can see the, the, the day come before right. you come down. Um, things like that have the power of breaking down a secular perception of the masculine. Mm -hmm. uh, really tempering that kind of rigidity and mas masochistic uh, self-definition. You have to be this way. You can't cry because that's, that's not good. Yeah. Uh, to the point where what is left is something so uh, so palpable, so tangible, that it can be compared with the element in nature. And so, I don't know how best to say this thing, it's just that um, um, as long as modernity defined itself as masculine, mm -hmm. you know, um, a lot of problem for which change is sought are not gonna are not gonna go away. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, uh, and I'm not saying that to emphasize, you know, the 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 beauty of uh, more indigenous tradition, but I have to say that it's that uh, you know it would be interesting if modernity could uh, could switch a little bit uh, its masculine supremacy uh, 
move away a little bit and let uh, the feminine take over for a while, just as an experience. Let's see what's going to happen. Right. You know, for several millennia, you know, the uh, uh, the male defined as this uh, in such a rigid fashion has contributed to the evaporation of the magic in the world. You know, you name it, uh, from the old time where, uh, this, you know, the Greek time when, uh, you know, the magician and the, the oracle reader were, by the way, blind people, um, to the, you know, the Middle Age uh, uh, prosecution of the, uh, the witches. Uh, most of them were women, uh, down to the modern era. I think that there's something about that that uh, history needs to, uh, we need to read at, we need to read into. Uh, because what it says is that somehow masculinity is defined as some kind of police working against the, the magic. <laughs> working against something that is supposed to be a part of, the, uh, of, all, of, of us all, to the point where uh, magic has become rather superficial, you know. What if there's something much deeper behind Santa Claus? What is something, there's something deeper behind, you know, St. Patrick Day? Uh, much more important than the beer, for instance, right. you know. And the leprechaun, if they were, if they were for real, if they were accepted, thereby establishing the fact that, you know, we have our limits. We are human. There are others. Uh, and what if, you know, uh, all of these things were brought to be part of our daily life? What would be the current status of the male and the female? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it will be kind of interesting to explore if we want change. Mm -hmm. Change and experimentation go together. You know, mm. you got to experiment with various things as opposed to standing with the same, same old, same old, and eventually defining change as a cosmetic touch upon the same old thing, mm. uh, looking at it from a different angle. What if you sweep through the whole thing and put some other monument in there? Maybe it will be, it will be the kind of thing to reckon with. So again, to your question, how uh, do you become a gentleman, a man in the, in the modern culture? I wouldn't say that I come into it knowing how you do that, uh, because there are all kind of uh, situations, there are all kind of setup that are making sure that you stay within, at least uh, reasonably within the, the, the norm of masculinity as defined by modernity. Now, if you want to change that, then you'll be going against the grain. And you have to raise the question whether this is what you want to do or you want to comply with the, the same old, same old thing. The John Wayne. Yeah, the John yeah. Wayne type of thing. Yeah. I think that uh, <laughs> there's an increasing number of people, particularly young people who are waking up in these days, um, to something that they are responding to more like as magical thing. It is it, the kind of thing that excites. You know, when excitement is something that is not manufactured, then it has a genuine signature that could uh, throw a person into an unpredictable journey. You know, that makes it an adventure. An adventure is something that should be part of the definition of life on this plane. So, uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, I think that um, a revisitation of the notion of sacred uh, could be a, a good point of departure to um, reshaping the kind of perception that we have of our reality and make it perhaps more, much more inclusive uh, and accepting of the possibility of other realities. Right. We should sit up. Um, so in, in everyday Western culture, for people who aren't going to have the opportunity perhaps to study with you directly, how mm -hmm. do you recommend that people kind of do reconnect with that sacred or with that spirit? 
What, what are things we can do in our everyday life? Oh, I think you already know some of that. You know, meditating is a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you can start your day with a moment of silence, uh, where you're at least, you at least acknowledge that you are one with the cosmos. Mm -hmm. You know, you are not an isolated individual, mm -hmm. ostracized, who needs to go out there and try to figure out a way to survive the day, but actually that you're part of a whole web of life and you are out there to contribute your share to the vitality of the world. I mean, that's a good start, you know. Coming more from a, an Afri African perspective, I would say that, uh, you know, you, you start your day with um, uh, an address, you know, a word or two to the ancestors, you know, that's what we do. To uh, my ancestors yeah. or everyone's? To your ancestors, start, okay. start at home, you know. Okay. Tell the spirit of your grandfather, look, I'm just going to go to school today. You know, uh, I never know what's going to happen. So if you were to walk in your invisibility next to me and uh, really whisper some stuff to me uh, that I can pick up as instinctual or, you know, intuitive, uh, at least uh, I will come home feeling like you've guided me. So can we at least give a shot of that for today? You know, I'm not saying you got to go there in a Christian fashion, kneel on your, on, on your knees and then uh, go into this kind of solemn prayer mode as if you're some kind of helpless entity who, uh, who needs uh, need all the help you can get. No, I'm, I'm just talking about some kind of ways in which there's a companionship with the other world, you know. Uh, and that's what is more African than anything. What we do is call out on our ancestors every day and tell them, you know, to at least uh, use their perceptive uh, wisdom to clean up obstacles that might be hiding in the way. Because yeah, although I have two eyes, I can't get. I don't. I don't see dimensionally. So I would actually think of my grandfather or my grandmother if they passed away. Yeah. Yeah. Once you have, I mean, it's at least an African thing that. Once you've shed your physical body, you become a lot more wiser and uh, more perceptive. You know, you see across dimension, which is really nice. Hmm. Uh, I wish I could do that while having the body. Uh, why not? If it's negotiable. The, 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 uh, the result of that, uh, uh, your attachment to those uh, who are still connected with you is of such nature that you, you define your involvement in this world as one that in, in, implies you're helping them. You know, uh, so that using their, the seed of their instinct and intuition to lodge pieces of information that they can translate in their own way as, oh, I like this, oh, I like that. Oh, you know what, I feel like I'm gonna go to the mountain today. Mm. When in fact, it was, it's, uh, it's your grandfather who mm. came to you and said, look, there's something I want to show you up there in the mountain. But if your grandfather were to show up and say, look, come on, let's go, you'll, you'll freak the hell out of you. Uh -huh. Whereas talking to your instinct, to your intuition, and, they, and thereby making you feel like, oh, you have developed suddenly a liking or an interest in going to the mountain. That gives you a certain kind of autonomy. You know, it still gives you a kind of autonomy. Yet, it was your grandfather's opinion. That's helping you, guide you. They're or... helping and guiding you in that way. Right. So there's something about that to uh, at least experiment with and uh, uh, on the basis of the, the positive result, at least uh, lend credence to it, you know, why not? You know. So a final question, I know we're running mm -hmm. out of time, but um, yeah. um, particularly in, in your childhood mm -hmm. um, and also in your, your nation's history, there's been a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, do, what is your view, is the spirit, is that our basic human nature, is that a positive human nature? And if well, so, why, why do we cause each other so much suffering? Spirit is definitely our basic nature. Uh -huh. And uh, more often than not, suffering is a signal that uh, something radical wants to change. More often than not, the pain that we experience is the expression of the physical when hit 
by the demand of the other world for a radical transformation. Mm. And so um, in a cosmic perception or cosmic scale, what we, what we see as suffering, uh, disease, uh, hunger, and so forth, um, that's actually a message embodied by certain people and directed at the world to read. And uh, when we don't read that, it means that the same thing will reoccur somewhere under a different form. We see the same thing in, uh, in this part of the world. When somebody shows up somewhere with a gun and just shoot anything to move, mm. we can, in our narrow-mindedness, lay blame on the person. But also, in the cosmic scale of the thing, we can see that person as a potential carrier of a message that has been ignored over and over and over. Mm. And so all of that boils down to what? It boils down to you know, us needing to invent a meter to measure the level of our compassion. Mm. Uh, not to just say that we are compassionate, but have a way of pointing a device at you and say, oh, you have 10% of compassion. You're out, yeah. or you know, you pointed over there. And, oh, that's twenty-five percent. You're starting to qualify or something. Yeah. Uh, but you know, short of these things, uh, what we say may not be what we mean, and what we mean may not be what we communicate, mm -hmm. because words have this kind of resiliency. So you're, you're saying yeah. to have compassion for our so-called enemies or people ca causing That's us right. suffering? That's right. That's right. And also have compassion for those who are carriers of certain kind of embodied painful messages to the world. Hmm. You know, recently they started talking about autism. Uh -huh. You know, what if autism is a message to us, to, uh, to the world, to society? Uh, what if uh, all these uh, generic illnesses, like Alzheimer's, uh, is a message. Uh, and uh, not unlike what we refer to in so-called poor country as hunger, uh, disease, and wars, and so on and so forth. Uh, what if all of that constitute messages directed at us that we need to pay attention to for the sake of our own growth and transformation? Uh, it is better to put it that way than to think that we can feel comfortable knowing that when we see someone suffering there, we're grateful that it is not us. Right. So we go home to our cozy TV dinner and uh, uh, realize that, uh, God, we must be a little luckier than uh, we thought we were because we saw something really bad and it could have been us. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and we were talking about, just as a final note to that, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, having compassion for your enemies or for people um, who are suffering mm -hmm. or causing suffering even. Yeah. Your, your name itself means friend. Yeah, right? it was a stranger. It was the enemy. Right. And, uh, and that's it, been it's, your life's... It's a very you know, painful name. Uh, right. But uh, uh, it's based on the concept, basically, that uh, you know, your name is an encapsulation of your purpose. Right. What your you mission. Came, your mission in this world. And uh, strangely enough, maybe if... Uh, if I didn't carry the, no, the name Maladum, I wouldn't be here. I would have been probably still in the village. Your you name know? means friend to the enemy or to the stranger. Yeah, to that's the other. right. Because in the enemy and stranger is the same right. thing. You know, who right. knows? Because uh, a stranger could be your killer. Uh, right. And uh, it, it, it happened as a result. It's a word that was coined uh, in the mid mid 1800 when. Europe started uh, doing all these things in Africa, you know, the, the priests come with a cross and the next thing there's, there's guns and bullets. Uh, I thought yeah. we were friends. It's the, it's <laughs> the carrot and the uh, stick. <laughs> That's <it>. right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I'm not going to go into that. Well, thank you so much. Uh, um, you're welcome. We might, do we?
Okay. Well, thank you so much, Melody. Oh, no, thank you. I appreciate honor. this. I yeah. appreciate that this was possible. And next time we okay. should get together and bury bury ourselves. <laughs> in the when the ground is a little warm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, uh, you're welcome. Okay. And uh, thank you all of you for listening. Malado yeah. Masome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Great. It was a pleasure. It was yeah. very delightful. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.